Welcome back, traders and investors. We are here with Dan Emmons, financial software engineer, trading, hedging, and investors, investing enthusiast. Dan, how you doing on this uh, this Monday morning with the S&Ps up nine points? Oh, I'm doing great. Uh, like everybody else, uh, uh, you know, a little surprised, but not too surprised that we're seeing some rallies off the lows. Um, you know, everyone was looking one way. And, you know, there's this theory of the uh, bathtub water um, in the market. You know, when you, when, you're, when you think about the market, it's prices moving, uh, you know, throughout the day, fluctuating up and down. But really, if you think about it, it's, it can move much like water in a bathtub where you go too far, too fast one way. And when there's so few participants in that directional move, uh, people are just kind of on uh, the side waiting, hoping to get a good entry. And when you least expect it is when you see these types of moves. Uh, everyone was looking at that gap down last night. I know I was, uh, especially in the NASDAQ, the, the leader to the downside. Uh, when it shot down to, uh, I believe it was 34.25, somewhere around there, uh, people were still looking lower in the S&Ps um, uh, as well. I, I, I know I was looking for, I was looking to get long around uh, 1795, which I see uh, could be some great hourly support. And, you know, make no mistake about it, we could still go down there um, in the real uh, trading session, but uh, I think it caught a lot of people off guard. We might see some chasing in the open, um, but I've got my levels. And you're going to stick uh, with them, okay? For. So, <laughs> were, were you uh, the, were you kind of like the, uh, a trader, and then you turned into financial software engineer, or is it the other way around? You were involved with the okay. financial software, yeah. and that brought you to trading. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, I'm 32 now. I started my career in the hedge fund space in 2001. I was 18 back then. Uh, you know, I was in college and was able to find a job in my career of choice, which is software development. And I didn't really have um, this great grand vision of myself uh, entering finance at that time. But as soon as I got started in it, I was hooked in the energy that, that's in this space. So over 14 years, I've picked up knowledge in various trading strategies like convert bonds, risk arb, uh, global global macro managed futures. Um, but my role back then was to work with the traders. I wasn't a trader, I was a software developer, uh, to build portfolio management software that helped uh, calculate thousands of what-if scenarios. Uh, you know, people can't do that in their head quickly. <laughs> uh, so the software I developed uh, evaluated exposure to a diver diverse amounts of moves in the market that you know, when you're in a position, it's hard to foresee certain shocks in a given environment. You know, what if interest rates move, uh, you know, uh, 50 bips, 250 bips. You know, we might not think of those moves today, but they could be unforeseen. And uh, even even things like, you know, euro exposure or um, Aussie exposure or even, you know, moves in crude that could affect equities. So... Uh, as I moved on in my in my career, I started trading about five years ago, uh, my own uh, portfolio, and I initially started out in stocks. Um, you know, but I was having I was having a great difficulty as most traders do when they start out, um, thinking they have a, 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 a good understanding just because they've been in that space. Well, I went through life and learned my tuition the hard way, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, I, I've actually found that for me, uh, I was getting torn up in equity, individual equities, and I was finding greater success in futures trading. And, you know, I, even though it's a, a levered instrument, uh, I was finding my ability to scale in and out of positions uh, a lot easier um, based on, you know, technicals. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm basically a pivot trader. Uh, so there's some there's some uh, formulas that I that I use, but I'm, I've modified them a little bit um, to have a little bit of a proprietary uh, edge. 
So what are you trading now? So you're trading uh, the NASDAQ futures and the S&P futures. NASDAQ, S&P, the mini Dow. um, But honestly, um, if if an opportunity presents itself in another market like crude, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not a heavily active crude trader, but throughout the day, there are are times when uh, crude has gotten up into you know, some massive R2 uh, resistance, and I have no uh, no problem putting out a trade as long as I've defined my risk ahead of time. Right, so um, you're using you know? the outer parameters on the pivot formula R1, R2 uh, to fade a move in the, in the market and something like crude. Like, and I know, I noticed that got up to 104.55 overnight. You had yesterday's high at 104, uh, Friday's high at 104.44. I mean, is it something that you have programmed in to hit those levels and do a trade, or are you, do you wait till it gets to that level and then react to it? You know, uh, years ago, I used to uh, trade the overnight session, and there can be some good money made. But honestly, I've I've found that uh, there's a lot more money to be lost in the overnight sessions. <laughs> uh, so I I did not place a trade when I, I saw that rotation happen overnight, and I'm not always awake in the overnight sessions anymore. Right. Um, right. I I feel like. Uh, you know, you can really exhaust yourself if you try to stay up, uh, you know, 19 hours watching the screen, and it really hurts your your daytime trading as well. At least that's been my experience. Now, obviously, if you caught the double bottom in NQ and ES overnight, you're you're sitting pretty right now. Yeah, but Ready to uh, go back to for bed. the most part. <laughs> For the most part, those kind of moves don't always happen. That's the exception to the rule. And what I like to do is use the overnight levels as guidelines Excellent. for where yep. you know support may be in real time sessions. So right, because it has. Yeah, I like to use those levels as well. Uh, so what? Uh, so are you writing? You're writing code. What? Uh, what platform are you doing it on? Well, I, you know, the, the code that I'm writing is actually, it's not automating any of the trading that I'm doing. I'm very, I'm very uh, subjective when I enter a trade because the market is very fluid and I actually don't want any resting orders out there. You know, I, I have an idea of where I want to get in, but what I like to, you know, one of the tactics I, I picked up was actually uh, through Anthony Cordelli of the Mini Exchange. And what he likes to say is use the one or the five minute chart to get into the 60 minute chart. What that means is the 60 minute chart has the more important levels of support and resistance. Uh, And you don't really know how the market's going to react to that level. It just because something is R2 or R1 doesn't mean it's going to stop on a dime. And I'm not going to put a five or a 10 or 20 lot on uh, a, a position immediately just because price got up there and you know I, there are algos out there that are quick enough to to put a position on and as soon as it starts going against you take it off but that's just not that's not my style um i used to be very rigid on a price and then again learned the hard way that uh you know re- support and resistance is really a, a a range of prices and if you start getting through that well you what that your reason for getting in that position is now invalid. So why why stick on that position? Okay, so, so the, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say uh, the the type of code that that I've written in the past was more of a, a macro perspective and not okay. not for intraday trading. So you're not a you're not a high frequency trader then. No, and you know if you bring, I'm glad you actually brought that up because you know that's, that's been. That's been a uh, uh, a point of a lot of arguments. I know at least on Twitter and now mainstream media is getting involved and apparently somebody's ticked off about it. <laughs> Somebody important enough is ticked off about the high-frequency trading um, that's getting all this attention. But honestly, um, you know, for me, when I think about HFTs, it's it's a fact of life. It's a, it's a part of trading that's a reality, and you have to – you have to learn a way to deal with it if you're going to trade. Um, if, if you, the, there's no money to be made in, in arguing whether it's right or wrong. 
Um, there's no money to be made in complaining about it either. So uh, I would rather find ways of competing with it on uh, a different scale. I can't compete at the nanosecond level right now. So, uh, and, and another point is that um, the way that HFTs are discussed is it's as if all HFTs and all HFT companies are working together against the little guy to, mm-hmm. to take profits away. And it's just not true. They're, they're competing on the same level that we all are in, in, the, in the sense that they're competing with each other. So not, not all HFTs are stepping in long ahead of you. Not all HFTs are stepping in short ahead of you. But they're, they're also competing against each other. So I think if there is a net effect where at some point, if you're not competing at their speed level, you can still find an edge in the market. You can still trade and still make profits. Um, of course, you know, if, if, if you live and die by a few pennies, you might want to reconsider um, being in the market. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, at the futures level, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty painful to have um, your – your your stop taking out one one second and have it go in the opposite direction. But uh, I I choose to not uh, put on trades that are so tight that that one tick for or in my favor or against me will will determine my fate in trading. Um, so you know I, I, it's maybe a controversial take on it, but it's my it's my opinion. No, I, I think that that, I mean, you know, it's not if you can't beat them, join them, but, you know, you have to be able to take, you know, what the market gives you and develop trading strategies. So I have to agree with you along those lines. So you didn't get your buy, buy off in the S&Ps here. We floated up nicely here on uh, on some Citigroup numbers, Citigroup training up a buck 82. So if you, did, you didn't chase it on the run up here, are you just, do you have a particular levels or a system that you're going to be looking at here to enter the market on the short side or since you missed your buy for the day you're just kind of you're just going to be patient perhaps looking at some other markets well i've definitely got uh some clues i'm going to be looking for um the it's it's hard for the s p to rally without uh the xls you know the financials um it's the xls was trading weaker relative to the dow uh, on friday but uh you know, the S&P will struggle to rally without them. Uh, I think it, it's uh, the 50-day moving average is about 2181. I'll be looking at that. I'm not sure we'll get all the way up there, uh, but on a support uh, support level, I'll be looking at 2131. Uh, if we remain below that, if, you know, it, it seems like it's so far away since we rallied, but if we remain below that level, we, that's pretty dangerous for longs in the S&P. Uh, if we're able to get above about the 2150 level, uh, we could really spark a rally all the way up to 2181, and then that would mean uh, that the S&P continues its its bullish stance um, at least all the way up to, uh, you know, I'm just pulling up the chart. I believe the Globex highs on Friday were about 1831. So, you know, that's only 10 points away. Um, and it could even uh, revisit... Uh, Thursday uh, mid range, I think. But you know, I got to pull the fib. No, well, that's uh, okay. All right, somewhere so wh- between 1860 and, and 18 and 1840. Okay, so you don't, you know, you don't have exact models. You have parameters that you're looking for um, in the markets. Uh, I just, just real quickly, do you, you have for people that are just getting into the markets? Uh, you know, as for trading, are you? Do you encourage them to, uh, you know, t- try and develop trading systems and follow them, or do you think that there's other, you know, there's already stuff out there that it's good to follow? Or what advice do you have for new traders? Well, uh, always, you know, especially when you're starting out, be humble. Uh, you know, don't don't go all gung ho. You know, just because you opened up a, a trading account or just because you got your futures. Uh, trading rights enabled on, on think or swim <laughs> uh, that, you know, just because you see a big move in the market means oh, I'll just hop on that. Like it, like it's a, a stock breakout trade, 
you know, you can you can really see a trade go against you very quickly. And there's a lot of there's a lot of people uh, selling services, some of which uh, are completely legitimate. But I would say if if that's the route you're gonna take, make sure you see uh, a, an actual trading track record and not just someone uh, selling a signal to you. Um, uh, there, there is a, a niche market out there for, for, for those that have made a business out of it. But, um, I think it's important that the person that you're following has actual money on the line. Um, you know, because, uh, when, when a trade goes against you, it's not just technicals. We talk about price levels all day and technicals only get you so far. Ranges only get you so far, but the psychology of trading is so much more important and knowing yourself in how you can deal with a losing trade, how, you know, how, the levels at which you know you're wrong when you enter a trade are so important so that when it gets to that level, you're, you've already accepted the risk in the trade. And yes, it's painful to lose money, but it's more painful to add to a loser and see it go further in your face. And you never want to let that that last trade you put on become the last trade you put on. Okay. Um, so, okay. I, it, you know, I, I, I personally don't follow any particular services. I uh, was starting out. Uh, I learned a lot from a lot of different individuals out there, but I never really entered a trade because someone else said so. You want to make sure that you understand why you're entering that trade. Why you're getting in, why you're getting out, and why you have a target. Excellent advice. So we've had Dan Amazon, financial software engineer, trading and hedging, investing enthusiast, uh, giving us a, a little bit of a preview of his trading. Dan, thanks a lot for coming on. And good luck trading the markets today, and we hope to have you on again. Hey, thanks for having me on. It was great. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dan. Have a good day.